Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we are going back to the novel Down the Stream of Stars by Jeffrey Carver. This is the second and final novel in his Star Stream series. And this is part two. For the first part of this novel and the first novel in the series, there will be a link to a playlist at the end of the video. Before we continue, if you like this content, please subscribe give us a like, and drop us a comment. And now, part two of Down the Stream of Stars. Joe took Claudie and Shiki on a backroom tour of the Circle Zoo before it was open to the public. He also allowed them to peer into the auditorium where some of the circus performers were rehearsing. He told them that the circus gets half fair for traveling on the colony ships as long as they allow the passengers and crew to see their shows. He next took him to see the Lopico. Its name was Baku. When he reached its enclosure, he called to it, and before she could see it, it answered, Who's there? Joe told it that he has two nice kids that he wants her to meet. When it came out of its cave, Claudie could see that it was intelligent, but the spark that she had with Lopo was missing. Plus, Baku didn't seem very happy at being bothered, so Claudia apologized to it, saying they didn't mean to bother it. Baku then said she's seeing too much and hearing too much, and she thinks that her teacher is under fritz. And as Joe said he looked into it, Baku then told him to tell it to keep the bats away. Then as Baku headed back, into the back of her enclosure, she said to Claudia and others, nice to meet you. As the two of them began to walk away, Claudia kept thinking that she had seen something in the gloom, something that looked like a human face. Joe didn't see anything, but Shiki said that he saw it too, a face. When Joe went off to take a look, Claudia and Shiki saw it again. It looked like a ghostly figure of a man and it seemed to be looking right at her. And she asked, who are you? And he raised an eyebrow. It seemed to be listening to her and she could see its face change. Just as she asked it again, who are you? That's when Joe came back, not having found anything. Joe hustled him out of there with Claudie saying he really was there. When Claudie and Shiki went to get into the lift, they discussed the fact about what they saw and the fact that Joe didn't believe them. And Shiki went on to say that it reminded him of when they was doing the sim and they saw her appear for a second, looking kind of spooky, just like that man. Claudie replied that she wanted to know who it was because even if nobody believes them, she thinks it was a ghost. That's when Shiki invited Claudie to come see his entity. He says, they call it a he because they're not sure if it's a he or a she. So Shiki took Claudie to his place where he lived with his father. And his father introduced himself saying his name is Raphael Hendu. Most people call him Rafi. Shiki told his father that she's in his class and he's going to show her Watson. Shiki took Claudie to his room and there he pulled out a box shaped like a bubble and in the bubble was a ball of yellow light. The entity floated up into his hand when he called it and he introduced it to Claudie, saying its name is Watson. Shiki told her that it came from Dirty's Hope. He showed her how he can get Watson to change from a ball of energy into a small furry animal that Claudie recognized as a stroid. Shiki then taught Claudie how to feel what Watson is feeling with her mind. Shiki went on to explain that his mother gave it to him before she died and that she told him it's a sentient alien entity. Then the two of them along with Watson perched on Shiki's shoulder left to try and get something to eat. He broke in to explain about the starship that Claudie and Shiki was traveling on. The starship was called Charity but it began its life under the name Loss of Innocence when it was operated by the shipping combine United Mercantile. Later, 
it was sold to an independent shipper who named it Prince of the Skies. Later, he sold it to the Kerrain, who renamed it Great Labor, before it was finally sold to Colony Transits, who remodeled it and then renamed it Charity. By this point, there were thousands of starships carrying colonists down the star stream towards the inner galaxy. The Charity was one of the few starships that did not put its colonists to sleep, but kept them awake and trained them so that they can survive on a new planet, since it was highly unlikely for two starships to meet in the star stream, nobody really worried about the carcinogen because the chances of meeting that enemy in the star stream was small, but there were some that was paid to worry about it, like the captain. The captain is having a nightmare. He's dreaming about when the Thorgs came to his planet Hassan Harbor. When they came, they killed everything, men, women, children, soldiers. They were without form or solidity, and they destroyed everything. The land, buildings, people, even the surface of the planet. And they had killed his wife, Myra. Then he woke up out of his nightmare. Then he knew it wasn't just a nightmare, it was his memory, and it happened four years ago. He had been free of the nightmare until three days ago when he got a message. And the message indicated that there was a real danger to his ship and passengers. And he'd have to tell the passengers soon. So he called the bridge. John Melnick, Claudie's father, was in shop when the shop instructor told them to put down what they're doing and come over and listen because there was an announcement from the captain. As he put down his tools, an alien, an MCAC, said to itself, No, no, sorry, no, oh, not good, but don't say it, you don't know, so don't bother people. When John turned and asked it if he knew anything about it, it said, No, sorry, I was thinking, feeling, you might say, but I shouldn't have spoken aloud, sorry. That's when a hollow of the captain appeared. Claudie and Shecky was down in the kitchen with Miss Freeney, who gave them juice and crackers when they heard the announcement come over the speakers. The announcement said for all colonists to report to primary classrooms for a special update and for all school children to go at once to their classroom for a special message from their teachers. The two of them decided to use the walk-up instead of the lift, which is already crowded, as they headed up to their deck school. Halfway up, they checked the lift again to see if it was less crowded and they were able to ride the rest of the way up. Once the kids were all in class, Mr. Seipeldon told them that they had an announcement and that they are going to make an unexpected planet fall, that the captain had gotten a message warning of some trouble down the star stream. They don't know if it's anything serious, but they don't want to take any chances. Naturally, the kids got all excited and afraid because they thought it was frogs. Mr. Sipleton, who was losing control, turned it over to Mr. Zizmer. Mr. Zizmer got the kids under control and then told them he's going to show them a short feature on the planet they're going to visit. It's called Method's Walk. He told the kids to think of this as an adventure. Lopo was hanging in the med room when he felt something that made him know that he wasn't alone. He felt a buzzing, then it seems as if he was staring down a long tunnel. What he saw made him fearful. It was a large winged creature that was floating in the air and it was coming closer. He tried to bark, but his throat felt funny, so he bared his teeth and growled. The air around the creature was glowing, but the creature itself was as dark as night. It looked like it had four or five eyes, and when he looked at its face, he felt terror. The creature must have heard him because it suddenly stopped and began staring at him. It just floated there, staring at him, with darkness seeming to be curled around it. After staring at him for a while, it just disappeared, and he could no longer see it or sense it. After it was gone, he just wished that someone would come and take him away. This time he jumps in to explain why the teachers didn't want to tell the kids about the frogs 
and to explain a little bit more about the Thuaks. He says that the Thuaks are terrifying even for adults, and if they are in the vicinity, then they pose a threat to the ship, and that all that the captain knew was that Thuaks were reported downstream from the charity, heading upstream, meaning they were heading towards the ship. He goes on to say that it was 73 years after the opening of the gateway that the Carthrogen first appeared and that the first encounter between Thuaks and humans happened. And in that case, three and a half million people on a human outpost world died. And it took many more millions to die on five other worlds before any type of organized defense habitat-wide was attempted. The attacks would come without warning, and at the time, no one had ever seen a Throg. At first, people thought that they came from a planet called Carthrog's planet after its discoverer. By the time that people realized that they didn't come from that planet, the name stuck and eventually got shortened to Throgs. What was known about them was that they struck without warning or cause, and their mode of attack appeared to be spatial disruption, a temporary transformation of force space into end space into which both living and non-living structures disintegrated. And on planetary surfaces, the disruptions would cause earthquakes and fire and stuff like that. And ordinary defenses were useless. They always came from the star stream and always struck close to it. And when they struck, they would create havoc and then disappear. Nobody knew where they came from. They assumed from the center of the galaxy where they went and why they came, what they wanted, and they didn't know anything about the biology. Besides using the star stream, no one knew how they traveled, and the strange thing was they traveled upstream against the flow. For humans to travel upstream, it took a lot of energy and was very expensive. There was a belief that the way they did it was biological instead of technological. Most ships did not survive an encounter with the Throgs, and the few warships that did were able to use their end space drives to confuse or distract the Throgs long enough to escape. They were never defeated, just a few times you were able to escape them. And one of the reasons that he was on the charity was because he and his employers wanted the charity to encounter the Throgs. They wanted it badly, so badly they could practically taste it. Once the video was finished, and Mr. Zismo took them back to the regular classroom. He told them that he was going to talk to them about the danger and a little bit about the Throgs. When her friends got a little afraid, Claudie felt as if part of her left her body and floated in front of her friends. And she saw Shecky and a couple of the others look at her startled. She saw Mr. Zismo looking at her too. The next thing that Mr. Zismo showed them was a vid on a space battle that only lasted about a minute. It was a ship being fought by some black shapes. After that, a professor came on saying, even though the danger from the enemy is real, you should always remember that the odds are with you. And then there was a graph showing how many ships made it through the star stream safely and the small number that are attacked by the Throgs. When the vids were over, Mr. Zismir had them put on their headsets for private conferences. And then Mr. Zismir came and sat in a chair facing her. He began asking her questions. The first thing he asked her was what does she think about leaving the star stream to go to Mefford's walk? He asked her, does it bother you that we're doing it to keep out of danger? And she just shrugged. Then he asked her, what about the Throgs? Then he asked her, I mean, what do you think about when we talk about them? And she says, I don't know. She was obviously afraid. He then asked her if she was afraid of the Throgs. And she, of course, putting up a brave front, said that she's not afraid of the Throgs. He then asked her that when he first mentioned the Throgs, if it made her feel funny, not scared, but something else like you were all tied up into knots or something happening inside you. And since that's exactly how she felt, she began to cry. And Mrs. Zizme gave her a tissue. He then tried to comfort her by hugging her until she stopped crying. 
he then asked her to draw him a picture of herself about how she felt when he said they were going to talk about the Thwarks. So she drew a picture of two of her, one floating up out of the other. When he saw it, he asked her if that's what she felt was happening, and she nodded. He then asked her if there was anything she can tell him about it, and said he had to ask because he called her Captain Melnick in a way you're still on duty, and that it is important for us to understand what you were feeling then. He then told her that the other kids noticed when it happened. That's when she told him that she was scared. Then explained to her that if she was a Logotian, then he would say that she was projecting a virtual presence of herself, a shadow self that can float outside of you. He then asked her to tell him about any time she had that feeling, and she did, and she especially told him about Lupo and how she and Shecky saw that ghost thing when they were at the circus zoo but how nobody believed that they saw it. He then asked her for permission to take a snapshot of her memories of that time, and he told her to just relax and try to remember, and that's when he took a snapshot of her memory. Then he made her promise that if she's ever to see anything like that again, that she'd come straight to the school and let him know. And later he will try to get her to have another visit to her friend Lopo. The intelligence system did not get a very good picture from Claudie's mind, but it was more interested in the other picture that they showed her and her reaction to it. And it was also pleased about the bonding that was taking place between Claudie, De Lopico, and Shecky. It was hoping that she would be able to develop her abilities quickly because its emerging plans would require it, and every bit of friendship would be significant. It was going to make sure that the teacher would encourage Claudie's unconscious talent for projecting not only virtual presences, but likability. And it was hopeful that everything would work out. Claudie's dream that night began nice. She dreamt of Lopo and him licking her hand. Then she dreamt of him being in the operating room, unable to move as he hung there. Then he began to howl in sadness, and she went to try and free him, but then she stopped when she saw a big black ship suddenly pop out of nowhere. It had big pointy wings. She screamed and separated herself into two, and then at first she thought maybe it wanted to speak to her, but then she suddenly knew what it wanted. It wanted more than her help. It wanted her, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. So the one thing she could do was to wake up, and that's what she did. When she woke up, she saw an enormous ball of light in her room. It looked like the sun. It was alive, and it knew that she was watching it, and it was watching her. And she heard a voice in her head, and she knew she was hearing that sun speak. And it said, my child, my children, from what realm have you come? Are you there, truly there? Can you speak to me and sing of your fear? Do not fear. Then it was gone, and she remembered it fondly because it took away her fear. Then she went back to sleep. The next morning she woke up feeling good. When she got dressed, she ran out and gave her mother a big hug, surprising her. Her mother asked her if she's afraid about all the changes, and she said it'll be okay because Mrs. Zisma told her that it'll be all right to be afraid of the throgs. Once they got to school and settled in, Mrs. Zismir began to show them a special on the star stream. It was when she was watching the star stream, how it came into being via a supernova, that she remembered seeing the bright sun-like star in her room. The vid told her that the star stream, one end is anchored into the black hole, that was Beetlejuice, and the other end is anchored into the big black hole in the center of the galaxy. The vid then explained how the star stream worked, and how the starships can enter and exit the star stream, not only at the ends, but at several nodes along its length. Once they exit the nodes, they now have access to K-space, which is faster than light, but much, much slower 
than using the star stream. Once the vid was over, Mr. Zizme asked if there was any questions. We will stop here and continue in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe, give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.